السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد How's everybody today? ما شاء الله I see a lot more people today Sunday yeah the good day excellent wonderful Okay so um, it's me my ummah my deen we're talking about unity again, you know, and this is a big problem for the Ummah, isn't it? So divided, and divided over what? But before that, I want to talk about what should we unite upon? Everyone talks about unity, 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 and sometimes they tell you some strange things about unity. Yes, we're everyone, we, we all unite, all groups, no matter what the difference is, uh, we're all the same. We're not all the same. There are differences. Now, there are a number of things. Sometimes we can recognize differences and still work together. Sometimes differences are so severe, there are differences in aqidah, that, and I'm going to clarify later on, inshallah, <clears throat> that we cannot work together. But we might unite for a political reason or something like that. Yeah. But sometimes people just tell you, no, we're all the same, we're all one group, let's just unite. So we're going to talk about what do we unite upon. That's the first thing. And no doubt we unite upon the Quran. And the Sunnah. But wait a minute. Everybody says they, they're upon the Quran and the Sunnah. Even weird groups, deviant groups, everyone's we're upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And I, they have to say that. You can't have a group that advertises, you know, we follow, we don't follow the Quran and the Sunnah. No one's going to come to them. So everybody says we follow the Quran and the Sunnah. So if we all follow the Quran and the Sunnah, why aren't we all united? Because of a number of things. We have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, according to how they understood it. Now, why is that? And isn't this limiting? So some people will tell you, excuse me, <coughs> that, well, why can't we come up with our own understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah? Well, if you look at the texts carefully, if you look at the ayat and the hadith carefully, you will see that the Prophet ﷺ came with one Islam, and this one Islam is to remain until the day of judgment. He didn't come with one, the version one of Islam. And then feel free to change it as much as you like. And then by the time the day of judgment comes, people are practicing version 734. And that will take him to a Jannah as well. No. Okay, a number of things. Why do we follow the understanding of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ? It's really easy, isn't it? They're the ones who were taught the deen by the Prophet ﷺ. Ayat were revealed when they were alive. Ayat were revealed concerning them. They lived it. They were there. And it was taught to them by the Prophet ﷺ what this ayah meant, what this means. So you can understand for sure, they had the best understanding of this religion. They had the best understanding and the best explanations. Just logically. It can't be that someone will come 1,400 years later and understand an issue that this man lived better than him. That just doesn't make any sense. Now, uh, not only that, but the Prophet ﷺ, in many hadith is telling us about, uh, to follow the understanding and to follow the way of the early Muslims. In one famous hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Alaykum bi sunnati. So you are to hold fast to, to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa after me. He's saying, hold on to it with your molars. So the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Likewise, the Prophet said the best of generations. خير القرون قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ثم يفشل الكذب. The best of generations is my generation. Then the one coming after them. Then the one coming after them. So sahaba, tabi'een and atba' tabi'een. These three. Then the Prophet said, then the lies will spread. The lies will spread. What does it mean? What are the lies here? And some of the scholars said the lies here mean the bid'ah, the innovations. People start to change the religion. So just logically now, if I want to be safe, if I want to be safe, I see so many different groups, so many different sects, so many different leaders. Everyone is saying we're upon the truth. Everyone else is off. No one's upon the So what do I do then? The, the way to be really safe, go all the way back and follow the understanding and the practice of Islam according to these three early generations. There's no way you do that and you're not safe. That's the safest thing. 
And that's what we're inviting everyone to unite upon. Let's unite upon the earliest understanding of, the, of Islam as taught by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, and the Prophet in every Jum'ah khutbah, and every time he would give a khutbah, he would say, Khairul Hadi or Ahsan al-Hadi, Hadi Muhammad. The best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For sure, better than the guidance of this instructor, that sheikh, whoever it is. There's no doubt about that. So it would make sense then to follow that guidance. Not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated to us in the Quran that the believers have a way, they have a path. There's the way of the Prophet sallallahu and then there's what the believers agreed upon. So you can't discount what the believers agreed upon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرِ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So whoever parts ways with the Prophet وسلم, after the truth, the truth has been made clear to him. Not only that, so now this is the first problem. He goes a different path than that of the Prophet And then وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرِ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And he follows a path other than that of the believers. What does that mean? Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, I was going through the Quran in my head, looking for a verse to prove ijma', consensus. And I found this verse. The verse says, he follows other than the path of the believers, which means the believers have a path. The believers have a way. So if you go apart from the way of the believers, then it should be an indication to you that you're doing something wrong. I'll give you an example. There's a sheikh <laughs> somewhere in America. I'm not going to give clues. And he will tell you, if you ask him a question, he'll tell you all the scholars of Islam say yes, but I say no. Or he'll tell you all the scholars of Islam said no, it's haram, but I say yes, it's halal. Okay, forget his evidence, forget anything. Let's just look at it logically. I'm going to put all the scholars of this ummah on one side of the balance. So I'm going to put Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa and Al Awza'i and Al Layth and Ta'us and Ibn Taymiyyah and just load up all the scholars for 1,400 years on one side. And they all said no. And then this guy said yes. Huh. Just logically, without even knowing what his argument is, who do you think is wrong here? It's clear that it's wrong. This is the way of the believers, the best of the ummah, the most righteous, the most knowledgeable. And all of them were wrong and only you were right. That's why just simple logic like that. Well, for example, one woman was saying, she, she's telling me in America, we will never know what the Quran is really saying until a woman makes a tafsir of the Quran. Really. Think about what you're saying. You're really saying that we, this ummah for 1,400 years, and even though the Prophet said he taught us everything and he died leaving us upon the clear path that's night like it's day, he was wrong. And the whole ummah still doesn't know what Allah is saying until a woman comes and gives us the translation of the Quran. Okay. Now, <laughs> you know something? This is, a, this is a strange mentality where people think that there's always some kind of war between men and women. And, you know, we have to translate the Quran and show the woman's perspective. And therefore, if we don't, we still don't know what Allah is saying in the Quran. Where did this come from? And did Aisha think this way? Did the, the mothers of the believers think, well, until the, we sit down and explain the Qur'an, forget how the men are. This makes it look like there's a conspiracy. Oh, the men are trying to dominate us. And they give their own tafsir. But the truth can only be discovered by a woman. Mm. Let me tell you something. There is no war between men and women. There is no war between men and women. You know why? Because we won already. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. There's no war. You know, Ibn Abbas, he used to say, لا أبالي أي النعمتين أعظم. I don't care which of these two blessings is greater, that Allah guided me to Islam or that Allah guided me to the Sunnah. What does that mean? That's amazing. That the Islam, Sunnah equal to me. Why? Because if Allah didn't guide me to Islam, I would be under the threat of going to the hellfire. And within Islam, if Allah doesn't guide you to the Sunnah, you're still under the threat of going to the hellfire. 
need the sunnah. Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah in his book Sharh al-Sunnah, the explanation of the creed, he starts off point number one, know that Islam is the sunnah and the sunnah is Islam. That's what it is. Now people think Islam is, the sunnah is just something optional, you know. If you have time for it, do it, it's extra credit. If you don't have time, you're, you're okay. That's what they think the sunnah is. Wrong. One way, one path, one ummah, one path to Allah, sirat. How many times do we ask Allah Azza wa Jal each day? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Who in here can tell me the plural form of sirat? Huh? Nobody. Some linguists say there is no plural form of sirat. There isn't. There is no plural form of sirat. You've never heard it before in your life. Ever. Why? Because it's only one. That's all we know about. It's one. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us a visual of this as well. When he drew a long straight line in the sand and he said, This is the straight path that leads to Allah. The scholars say, notice it's one. Notice it's long, which means you have to be patient upon it. Notice it's straight. That's the one that we all want, that we all make dua for every single day. Then a Muslim comes to you today, he's like, no, there's more than one path to Allah. You have your way to Allah. I have my way to Allah. He twirls around in a circle. He finds a way to Allah like that. He beats the drums. That's his way to Allah. Everybody has their own way to Allah. There's more than one path. So I'm, yes, you are right. There is more than one path. Hadith. The one path, long and straight, leads to Allah. Then the Prophet ﷺ drew lines coming out of that path that were short and curved. He said, these are other paths. At the head of each path is a shaitan calling people to the hellfire. So your friend was right. There are other paths, but they lead to the hellfire. Just one leads to Allah. So if there's only one path to Allah, one sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that means this is what we're supposed to unite upon. Not anything else. Not anything else. And <clears throat> what is interesting that if we can't unite upon the sunnah, then what are we going to unite upon? I saw this one guy, he wrote a book about how we need to re-evaluate all the sunnah and re-evaluate Islam for the 21st century. Okay. And he proposed a way, this is how we're going to do it. Now, if he were thinking logically, do you think the ummah is going to agree upon what he's suggesting, this guy, is a nobody. Sorry, but he was a nobody. Now, do you think the Ummah will agree upon what he's suggesting? Like, if we can agree upon the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, who is this guy we're going to agree upon his little book? 120 pages, he's proud of it. Mm, okay. Maybe you and your mother will follow it only. And the rest of the Ummah, who cares about you? Only your mother cares about you, nobody else. <laughs> All right. You know something? If you look at the month of Ramadan, we, this is one month where every group and every sect behaves the same way. Have you thought of that before? Every sect and every group, political or religious, they break fast at the same time. True? No one group says, oh no, this group broke fast at one o'clock and we will wait one hour. Another group will, will be early, 20 minutes. Every group breaks fast at the same time. Taraweeh, same time. Everything is the same in Ramadan. So you feel a sense of unity in the Ummah. Why? It's an indication for us that when we follow the Sunnah, we unify. But then of course we have to ruin it at the end. <laughs> what about the moon, moon fighting, right? Yeah. But when you follow the Sunnah, unite upon something. So if we're not going to unite upon the Sunnah, then we're never going to unite. And that's the easiest thing. So we're saying, let's all unite about, upon the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the early Muslims. But what about modern fiqh issues? No, that's a different issue. These are just a few issues here and there where the scholars can make fatawa and give different you know, uh, allowances. But in general, we follow the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which are the companions, the early generations as taught by the Prophet ﷺ. That's the safest thing, hands down. Oh, but I've got my Shaykh. He's in direct contact with Allah. Mm. Shaykh Iblis? <laughs> Don't give me that direct contact with Allah. Please, that's nonsense. Please. Okay. Um, let's do this now. So number one, this is what we're uniting upon. This is what we're supposed to unite upon. We want to talk about unity. What do we unite upon? That's it. That's number one. Number two, second point I want to make, what is it that 
when is it okay to disagree and when is it okay to separate? And there is an entire, if I can call it science, known as the ethics of disagreement. When can we disagree? Over what types of issues do we disagree? And we need to learn that because now we disagree over, let's just say, simple issues. True story that happened in America. Fight broke out in the masjid. Uncles punching each other. Pow, pow. Uncle jumping up on the mimbar, jumping down on another uncle. <laughs> so somebody called the police to break up this fight. Yeah? Now the police, they came to the masjid. And you know, so the entrance is here and the musalla area is far over there. And the police enter and oh, these people are fighting left and right. It started off with a simple fiqh issue. Now they're fighting, punching each other. Now, when the police entered the masjid, they entered with their shoes on. They don't know you have to remove your shoes or anything. And the uncles stopped punching each other instantly. Yeah, and then they did a double take. So an uncle was like this. And all of them suddenly stopped fighting and united against the kuffar. And came at everybody stopped fighting. I can just imagine the poor police officers. What kind of a strange fight is this? It stopped in a split second. And everybody turned angrily towards the police. Get out. You got your shoes on. Out. Shoes. Out. MashaAllah. I'll punch this believer in his face. But don't you ever, ever walk in the masjid with your shoes on. That's the real crime. This is okay. okay. That's the crime. Well, I want I'll tell you something. One time, three brothers in America, three young brothers, they're playing basketball. Then two non-Muslims came. They said, can we play with you? They said, okay. So now how are you going to break it up? So there were three brothers, and now, no, were they three? Yeah, there were three brothers, and two people joined them. Somehow the math is wrong there. Maybe there were four brothers. And just, just make it easy, huh? Four brothers and two people joined them. Yes, yes, they, yes, yes, they were four brothers, yes. There were four brothers. I even know their names, yeah? Four brothers, two people joined them. And the, the, the two Christians joined them, two non-Muslims. So one of them says to, to one of the Muslim brothers, brother, you join them, so it'll be three against three. Make sense? So that guy said, you want me to assist the kuffar against the muslimin? And they started fighting until he punched him in his face. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. We don't know how to disagree, people. That's the problem. We don't know when to disagree, when it's appropriate to fight and to disagree. So people are fighting in the masjid, but they unite against the, hmm, the shoes. Now, if you look at some amazing examples, Uthman ibn Affan, anhu, the third Khalifa, and he was uh, besieged in his home. By a group of people, if you look at their history, a number of them were highway robbers, people who were punished in the past, who were transgressed against Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, you know, uh, Ibn Sauda, who's a Jewish man who wanted to destroy Islam from the outside. All these kinds of people. And the Prophet specifically told Uthman that he's going to be assassinated. And he even told him the tribe of the person that will assassinate him. He knew everything. He knew what they were going to do to him. And yet, so these people came and they took over the city of Medina and they didn't allow anyone to carry a sword or to resist them. So they controlled the city for a number of days and now they were leading the Salah. We know they're highway robbers. We know they're people who have been punished before for disobeying Allah. The low quality, but now they're in control of the city of the Prophet and they're leading the Salah. They're leading the Salah. So the companions came to Uthman and they said, these people are leading us in Salah. Should we follow them or not? Should we pray behind them or not? And Uthman knows these are murderers and they're going to kill him. And he says, as long as the people are doing good, then you follow them in that good that they're doing. That's unbelievable. Look at the things we fight over now. Sometimes it's not even religious issues. Oh, this sister said this about my hijab the other day. This brother said this about my, my car or my beard. Or, oh, now we fight forever until the day of judgment. So, or worse yet, like some people speak like they don't know anything about the day of judgment. I ask Allah to gather me and sister so and so in front of him and judge between us. Over what? Uh, over what she said to me at the dinner. Wallahi? Do you know how serious that? What's wrong with you? Wouldn't you rather be in your house in Jannah eating grapes? 
No, no, I don't want to eat grapes. I want to be standing around. Allah, she said this about my hijab. Really? Grapes, fight. Grapes, fight. Let me fight. Pagal <laughs> So, <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that, man? Anyways, <laughs> you know, um, so, now, but, but do we just take, okay, we're going to get to a point, uh, we're talking now, do we just uh, accept everything and everyone, let's all work together and all that? Let, there are some guidelines. The guidelines are, but I know I want to tell you a story first, yeah? <laughs> this is a true story. There was a debate between, this is in, in like Pakistan, there was a debate between a Sunni scholar and a Shia scholar. So the Shia scholar wanted to insult him. So he said, Sunni or Sur, me kya fark hai? So the Sunni scholar gets up and slowly walks all the way over to the Shia scholar. Then he walks back to his seat. He says, Sunni or Sur, do teen foot ka fark hai. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll translate. Okay. So. This, the Shia scholar, this is a true story, so I'm not insulting anybody, but the Shia scholar said, what's the difference between a Sunni and a pig? Sunni and a pig, what's the difference? So the, the Sunni scholar, old man, he walks all the way over, he's measuring the distance. He comes back, he said the difference between the, the Sunni and the pig is about two, three feet. <laughs> one, of the, one of the Egyptian scholars and mashaykh, very famous mashaykh, Sheikh Kishk, rahimahullah, so the, uh, the security forces and what have you, they arrested him one time. They took him for interrogation and they sat him down. And the guy started, he said, do you know what the difference between you and a donkey is? And Sheikh Kishk, he said, this table. <laughs> That's what's between me and the donkey, this table. You're the donkey. And with him. <laughs> All right. Here's the thing. The scholars say it's only warranted, it's only acceptable to separate when we have a difference in the fundamentals of the religion. The fundamentals of the religion. We don't create a new jama'ah, a new group and separate and make a masjid across the street from this masjid, group A, group B, over fiqh issues, over differences of where to take the ummah or where to take our community or political issues. We don't separate over these things. It's only acceptable to separate if we have a difference over some of the fundamentals of the religion. Meaning, in our masjid, one group says, we believe there's a prophet alive today, after Muhammad sallallahu And if you guys don't accept that, we're going to start our own masjid. What do you say in this case? Open the door for them. Get out. Fine. No, 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 for the sake of the unity, let's all stay together. No. Here we separated on the fundamentals of the religion. But if we separate on fiqh issues and what have you, that's not worth separating over and it does not warrant separation. It's not proper Islamically that we separate over something like that. So the only time it's okay to separate when we disagree on the fundamentals of the religion. So, and, and we recognize these differences. So we can't tell me that there's a group that has a belief that's completely outside the fold of Islam, but for the sake of unity, we're all brothers and we can intermarry. No, wrong. But can I maybe join forces with them when it comes to a political issue? Yeah. I'm saying we're going to fight a law that legalizes X or makes that impermissible. So I can here join forces with Jews, with Christians, with any group and fight this issue because there's a better good uh, for the community. But don't, we don't do this thing where, no, we're all one and we're, we're all believers. No. There's something called disbelief. Our religion is very strict. Islam is very strict when it comes to belief issues, belief related issues. And it's very flexible when it comes to fiqh issues. There are difference of opinions. And but when it comes to religion, like aqidah, belief, we can't have doubt. Oh, I'm not sure if Allah is one or not. No, not acceptable. But I'm not sure when I say, Sami Allahu Naman Hamidah, do my hands fall here or do they come up here? That's acceptable. What have we done today? Reversed it. Today, if someone has an issue, they don't know where Allah is, you know, is Allah above his throne? Is Allah with us in this room? Oh, it's a khalas, it's okay, you know, Allah. I'm... But fiqh issue, <clears throat> brother. I don't even want to give examples in case it's one of those serious issues here. Yeah? <laughs> I won't. I'll just leave it at that. But there's so many fiqh issues people take very seriously. And they're ready to fight over. Or issues of madahib. Yeah? 
You have to have a madhab. You have to pick a madhab. Really? I can't just worship Allah. Mm -mm. <laughs> There's a true story that happened in Egypt. In Egypt, to some degree, they have all four madhab, right? But three of them have more of a presence. So this young man was getting married. And the, the imam tells him, so he's putting his hand in the hand of the bride's uh, father. And the bride's father says, uh, he repeats after the imam, I wed you to my daughter according to the sunnah of Allah, uh, to, to the book of Allah, the sunnah of his messenger, and the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. Now he tells the young man, now say the same thing, okay? I accept and I be, to be wed to your daughter according to the book of Allah, and the sunnah of his messenger. Young man is quiet. The imam says, and the madhab of Abu Hanifa. He says, I don't want to say this last part. Let's just skip it. He said, no, you have to say this last part. He said, no, I'll skip it. It's okay. No, it's not okay. You have to say it. And it got to the point where, okay, this marriage will be over tonight. Before it even <laughs> starts, it'll be over. And these young men said, I'm not going to say it. And they said, that's how everybody, that's how everybody gets married. You have to say it. So then the young man said to them, okay, I want to say exactly what Abu Hanifa's father said when he got married. Huh? How did people live and die and get married and divorced before the Imams, all four of them, were born? The thing is about the Madahib is that the Madahib are there to facilitate studying the religion. They're not there so you only worship Allah through the Madahib. This is what we've done now and made it confusing. So you have to worship Allah through a madhab. No, you study your deen through a madhab because it makes sense. So I study one madhab, then I can do comparative. It makes it easier for me to process all this information. It's not like you follow a madhab and you only worship Allah through that madhab. And sometimes there'll be a mistake in the madhab and someone will insist, well, I was born into this madhab, I have to insist upon it. And that's it. And now it got to the point that if you don't follow a madhab, then there's something wrong with you. They label people who don't have a madhab like that. So if you insist, we have to, you have to follow a madhab. Okay, what if someone takes shahada today? Which madhab do they follow? Hmm? How do they pick a madhab? Do they go on the largest, uh, the, the, the bigger population of a madhab in their area? Or do they automatically take the madhab of the person who gave them shahada? Or what, do we put like four madhab in a bowl and then he picks a piece of paper? I'm Maliki, Allahu Akbar. All the Hanafis are like, mm -hmm. upset about it. Whatever one you choose, give us your evidence. People just complicate things. Pick a madhab. Okay. Taib. <laughs> Here's another issue. So we're still talking about when is it okay to separate. And part of separating is labeling people. And one of the, way, one of the problems, one of the, ways we, the, one of the issues we have today is that if someone makes a problem, they're a zero. It won't make a mistake. They're done. So even if the sheikh, old man, 60 years, he's been working tirelessly for this religion. But he gives one fatwa that you don't like. What's the verdict now? He's a zero. Don't take from him. Don't listen to him. He's a deviant. Okay, 60 years of speech versus one statement. And this one statement offsets everything. It's not even in aqidah. And the example I always give is Sheikh Al-Qardawi, Hafizahullah. He's been teaching and working tirelessly for this religion before many of us in this room were even born. And then one fatwa someone doesn't like, don't take anything from Al-Qardawi. Don't take anything from him. As if every time he speaks, he's only saying this one thing. He says other things. Can I take these other things? He's got no aqidah problem. His aqidah is okay. It's sound. I can't take anything from him. He's a zero now. Years of work and just zero. This is how we behave now. A person makes one mistake, he's a zero. Don't take anything from him. Mubtada'. Don't pray behind him. Don't come in. His aqidah is okay. If his aqidah wasn't okay, we'd support you. Yes, don't pray behind him. He doesn't believe in the Prophet ﷺ as a final messenger. Fine. But this is how we are today. So ruthless with each other. No mercy at all. And that's not the way of the believers. That's not how the believers were described in the Quran, nor in the ahadith, nor at all. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, if you look, for example, with, on the same issue, the companions before, some of them committed major sins, major sins, and they were not considered zeros by the society. 
major sins I'm talking about adultery married and they committed zina and they were not bad mouthed no one said anything bad about them after that major sins like qadf which is accusing a chaste woman of committing zina or something يعني, that they don't have evidence for some great companions did that did that to whom to aisha radiallahu anha the wife of the prophet accused her of zina and they got their punishment for it and they're a normal part of the community now nobody ever said don't take any don't sit with them they're done they're go they're goners nobody ever did that because they had this sense of rahma amongst them that you're not a zero you're not done for the minute you make one mistake even if it's a major sin here it can be a fiqh issue and the lies and now especially with the internet people it's become worse and people think they're smart like a guy will pick a famous speaker and he'd badmouth him badmouth him and then 40,000 people will read what he wrote and he's actually very very proud of that that my post reached 40,000 people proud of a sin what if you got 40,000 sins who on earth would be like brother did you see my post I got 40,000 sins alhamdulillah if you saw it that way you wouldn't be proud of it this is how we are now people bad mouthing each other and wallahi we're so brutal with each other it's unbelievable it's one of the reasons I just I actually I, I hate Facebook everybody is so nasty there what happened to the akhlaq of the believers you whatever you say someone has something nasty to say about it no matter what even sometimes you give a khutbah about being kind to each other and someone will say something rude to you at the end I gave a khutbah about being nice one time and this guy sends the Imam a long text message it's these young speakers who are the problem with the ummah today and this disrespectful guy <laughs> like, the problem was with your brain you just misunderstood what I said everybody else who understood it you're the only one like this what do you think you're the only smart one or the other or the opposite Sent this rude email from a khutbah about being nice and gentle with each other so first of all, I'm not young anyways. I love how uh, Brother Adil announced me yesterday that I have decades of experience in da'wah. <laughs> how old do you think I am exactly? <laughs> decades, and at least, at least two decades, which means I, I started at what age? Okay, wonderful. Man, oh man. Just so, when is it okay to split up and make a big deal over something when someone disagrees with us on the fundamentals of the religion even then there's some back and forth try to explain it's not just the end of the world immediately but I'll tell you something and I want to close with this so the first section we spoke about what should we unite upon and we said the Quran and Sunnah according to the understanding of the earlier generations and we gave the hadith and ayat indicating why and the logic indicating why second point when is it okay to separate and to disagree we said when it comes not over fiqh issues but when it comes to issues of the aqidah fundamentals of the religion we disagree upon that we try to understand it we try to communicate we try to explain if it doesn't work you want to split off split off but we don't fight and split off over issues of fiqh and aqidah we don't label someone as zero because of one issue that we disagree with or one mistake and no matter what my advice to you is do not under any circumstances join into these things don't ever make make yourself out to be the gatekeeper for the sunnah guy is 22 years old and he's the gatekeeper to the sunnah he's telling he tell you which scholar is on the sunnah which scholar is not on the sunnah and they're like 60 70 years old and he's like in sitting in his moldy basement on his computer on this man is a mubtada who are you sweetheart 21 years old go blow your nose and eat your cereal okay play your video games go to sleep <laughs> what is this never put yourself in that position even if there is someone who is really a deviant here's the good news if there's someone who's really a deviant there are at least 600 other people who wrote about him why do you have to add your voice to it stay out of it Wallahi, what a blessing it is for you to be of someone who's always clean has nothing to do with insulting people yes but who will show people the truth? Not you. Well, I sometimes like this, and this young guy told me, yeah, but these people, Mubtadeen, we have to expose them like Imam Ahmad said. Listen, sweetheart, Imam Ahmad was the number one scholar in his area, the number one big shot, an Imam, uh, a leader, scholar in the true sense of the word. You can't say, well, he said it's our response. It's his responsibility because of his position. 
you're here. Don't do that. Always, always, you want to meet Allah Azza wa Jal with not bad mouthing anybody. And if you will bad mouth you, just let it go. You don't have to respond. You don't have to. Because the higher ground is to let it go. And this is the next section that we're talking about. All right. Um, the uh, next section, we want to talk about what causes us to love one another and what will get us to forgive one another, which is very, very important. How do I love everyone first? This is training, brothers and sisters. This is not one of those things where do this and you just go out and do it. This is training where you constantly train and teach yourself to, to first look at a believer with a look of love and mercy. It's really, it's, it's difficult. Well, I remember one time I walked into a restaurant and there were two Muslims, clearly not married, you know, girl sitting with a guy. And I don't know if you understand what this means. You can tell when the couple is married and when they're not, yeah? When they're married, they just sit like this. When they're not married, the guy, he can't sit straight. He's, <laughs> suddenly his body gets loose, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, he, you can tell when a brother is talking to his fiancée or to another brother. To another brother, mm, yes. <laughs> yeah? When he's talking to his fiancée, what happens uh, physiologically, his body collapses upon itself. So it's like this. And it could be freezing cold and he'll stand for one hour in the cold. <laughs> if it's his wife, salamu alaykum, everything okay, kids are okay, the house is not on fire, salamu alaykum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, let me tell you something. Wallahi, so I, you see a couple doing something haram. Um, at, the, at our university, there used to be a, a table where these young men and women just play cards. You could tell they're not married. They're just students at the university. They play cards right in front of the musalla. They never go into the musalla. And all they do is play cards. And they're like, you know, touching each other. Stop it. <laughs> like that. So what happens? All the people who come to the musalla area, they do the same thing. Men and women do the same thing to them. Musalla over there, that's the brothers and sisters over here. And this is what every group does to them. That's it. Sometimes there's something under their breath. Audhu billah. Astaghfirullah. How do you think they feel? How can I train myself when I see believers, even if they're in a sin? First response, I feel bad. I feel sorry for them. I feel mercy because they're in dalal. They're not praying. They're doing haram. They're wasting their life. And there's a Jannah and a Nar and a grave and a day of judgment we have to deal with. How can I train myself to first feel mercy and love? Wallahi, it's difficult and it's training. And you might have to keep pushing yourself for a year. But there will be a day, inshallah, if you keep pushing, when you first see a Muslim committing a sin, first thing, you feel sorry for them. And you feel mercy. You're an educator. You're a da'iyah. So you want to fix that situation. And you're, you, it could be that you're angered for the sake of Allah Azza wa You're angered for the sake of Allah. But that's not the first thing you present to them. So you come to them and this is how, if you look at most, if I can use the term, non-practicing Muslims, you'll find that they don't like religious Muslims. Why? Because this is all they get from religious Muslims. You come, these are, these are the steps. How to give nasiha to a Muslim committing a sin. Step one, stand in front of them, look them straight in the eye. Step two, frown. Step three, Say one word, and that is haram. <laughs> that's, the, that's the word. That's our favorite word, right? So anything is something. Brother, haram. <laughs> haram. That's it. That's good da'wah, huh? mashallah. When we were doing things that were wrong, did we want, would we have liked someone to come and gently take us by the hand and guide us to Allah? Or would you like someone to come stand in your face? Haram. I'm sure you wouldn't. So... From loving the believers, it's, uh, loving the believers is a sign of strong iman. And we all know this hadith. We learned when we were children. So none of you believes, meaning none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother or, his, or the sister as they love for themselves. So this is high iman. When I love for the believers as I love for myself, when I care for the believers, this is from the way of the Prophet ﷺ, who used to care so much about people following the truth and following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeying Allah Azza wa Jal. Number one, it's a sign of strong iman. Number two, try to see yourself in their place. And Allah did you a favor and a blessing, gave you an, uh, He gave you a blessing that He guided you. 
You could have been misguided, sitting in his place, and he could have been in your place, busy with masajid, busy with lectures, busy with things like that. It's so easy, it so easily could have been reversed. So first thing is you're thankful and you're grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal, that that's not the case. And you feel sorry for them. Because the people who, who are misguided, they're not praying, they're not obeying Allah, they think they've got a good life, they think they're happy, but they're not. So you feel sorry for someone like that. And we don't feel jealous, right? Allah blessed you, put you in this higher position, so you don't look down at people. You feel bad for them. You wish they could experience what you experience, not the opposite. But this is what, we ha what happens now. Like the sisters, I was a chaplain at a university, uh, George Mason University in America. And the sisters, because I'm the chaplain, sisters who don't wear hijab, they come complain to me about how the sisters who wear hijab look at them. Sister who's wearing hijab will walk by sisters without hijab and she gives them the dirty look. And sisters, uh, you know, the, I call it the Terminator scan. Yeah? If you ever see the movie Termin Terminator, he used to scan like that. Sisters, mashallah, they all have that device. They all scan each other. When you want to show disrespect to a sister, the first thing you look at her and you... Tit, 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 tit. Mm. She ain't nothing. <laughs> Wallahi, it's so bad. There was a lady in California. She took shahada and she was so excited to meet. She took shahada in the imam's office. She can't wait to meet her new Muslim sisters. She comes on Friday tr trying to tie some kind of hijab together. You know, no one taught her anything. She's so excited. She comes into the women's section and all the women start scanning her. <laughs> and they all just gave her dirty looks and, and stayed away from her. She ran out of that masjid crying and she never ever came back again. So, see yourself in their place, yeah? Train yourself to look with the look of mercy before anything. Wallahi, this is training. So when you leave this room, you start doing that. As you're sitting in this room, don't look down to anyone. So the sisters without hijab would complain how the sisters with hijab look down at them. Then the sisters with hijab would come to me and tell me about how sisters with niqab look down at them. I'm like, hey. You deserve it. And then the sisters with niqab, I don't know what happens to them. Yani. The sisters, I don't know, in jail, look down at them. I don't know. You could, men are looking at them. And anyways, the point is, if you could see, if you could, yani, if you could understand the problems people have, if you can get to know people have, it's time to stop? Is it time to stop? Okay. Okay, let me do this then, since it's time to stop. I want to close with how to forgive and pardon people, okay? How can I forgive just about anybody? Inshallah, this will help. No doubt, every single one of us here, we are going to stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal like this. Every single one of us. And Allah, the Prophet said, Laysa baynahu baynahu turjuman. There will be no translator between you and Allah. And Allah will directly ask you about sins you committed. And it's all recorded with Allah. On this day, you looked at that. On this day, you said this. On this day, you didn't do that, which I commanded you to do. Who in here is looking forward to that moment? Wallahi, nobody's looking forward to that moment. The Prophet describes in a hadith that the angels, imagine billions of people, billions of people standing. And then one person will be called by their name and the name of their parents. Now, from billions of people, the angels will quickly recognize that individual. How? Everybody's scared, everyone's looking down. But when that person is called, the angels will know. How will they see him amongst billions? Prophet said, from the intense fear that overtakes them. That's how the angels will know that's the one that was called. And he'll be dragged in front of Allah, and Allah will ask them every question like that. None of us in here are looking forward to that moment. Not a single one in the room. Now, but I guarantee everybody in this room would love the following to happen. That when you are brought in front of Allah and you stand like this, Allah says to you, go, there's nothing to talk about. Who in here would love that? So here's the thing then, brothers and sisters. Forgive people the way you want Allah to forgive you. And Allah mentions this in the Quran in Surah An-Nur. فَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Pardon and forgive one another. Don't you love that Allah will forgive you? It's like saying if you forgive people, Allah will forgive you. The same way you would love Allah to forgive you, forgive everybody. 
Now let's go back to that one person who says, I have forgiven everyone on earth except for sister so and so. And I ask Allah to gather me and her in front of him and judge between us. Okay. So you're saying, I'll forgive everybody except one person on earth, right? Now, okay. So now imagine you stand in front of Allah and Allah says, I have forgiven everything, all of your deeds you can go to Jannah. And when you do think this, well, there's one issue though, but we need to discuss, so come back. Who in here would love Allah to tell you, come back, there's one issue we need to talk about? Nobody. But that's what we're doing. I've forgiven everybody except that one. Okay, Allah forgives everything except that one. And if you want none, then pardon everyone. Everybody. It's not worth it. Nothing in this dunya is worth fighting over. I know what now some people start to think, and I get this question a lot. What about someone who abused me as a child? What about someone who always does this kind of harm to me or that kind of harm to me? And I'll tell you something. Not even just from a religious standpoint, but from a psychological standpoint. You go to any psychologist who's not Muslim, and they will tell you that it's in your best interest to forgive this person. One of the worst things you can do is keep someone in here. You know why? Because here, the heart, this is very, very valuable place. Very, very valuable real estate. And you're allowing that person to live here for free. I, this is so important here. I've got, I need I love for the Prophet ﷺ, for my family, Allah Azza wa Jal, the Quran. I, I have no room for, but no, I'm letting this wicked person live here for free. And I'm holding this and I'm chained and shackled. You know what I'm saying? You're chained and shackled. Oh, this man abused me when I was six years old. So forever I will be angry against him and I'll keep him here. The best thing and the only, actually the only way to move forward is to forgive that person. Not for him. Why forgive him? He did all these sins and he's not deserving. No, you don't forgive him for him. You forgive him for you because you're shackled until you do that. You know what he's doing? He's out there on the beach, jet skiing, parasailing, banana boat, eating bananas also. Ban yeah? And, and he's enjoying his life and here you are. I'm depressed. I'm unhappy because of what happened to me 26 years ago. And I will never forget that man. And because of that, I can't have a happy life. And where is he? He's on the jet ski, having fun, smiling. So what are you doing? You're just harming yourself. I can't enjoy my life because of him, something that happened 20 years ago, and he's having a great time right now. So you forgive people for you. What about this family member who always says bad things about me and they always nonstop insulting me? Forgive her. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? I think my sins are worse than what someone said about me. I would love Allah to forgive that for me. So forget this guy. Sufyan al and I'll close with this. Sufyan al rahimahullah. Someone came to him and said, some people are bad-mouthing you, insulting you, saying bad things about you. You know what he did? He sent them a bowl of dates with a message. The message said, it has come to my attention that you have given me some of your good deeds. You speak bad about someone on the day of judgment, you take from their good deeds. Or they might take your bad deeds. So... They're giving him a gift in the next life. He said, it has come to my attention that you have given me some of your good deeds. I can't find anything to thank you with besides this bowl of dates. So please accept it from me. Now, do this now. The next time someone's insulting you, saying some bad things, send them a gift, send them some oil, send them some chocolates. Uh, thank you so much. I heard uh, last night you were backbiting me for one hour. That is tremendous. I am badly in need of good deeds. I really appreciate this. And this, this chocolate is a gift for me to you. Now, what do you think? <laughs> if you really did this, what do you think that sister would do to you the next time she sees you? Thank you for the chocolates. He's too embarrassed. She can't even look you in the eye. Oh, the sister's coming. That's what it's about, people. Forgive people the way you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. And the holding grudges, all this enmity, hatred it goes against uniting and unity how am i going to unite with someone that i hate so much it's not going to work so all these are steps but they're all steps for training we ask allah to grant us guidance thank you for being an attentive audience